Okay, so today for our webinar 63, we have Maxim, President and CEO Paul Babb, who give us a peek at Cinema 4D Release 14's powerful new features. These include fast and intuitive sculpting tools, enhanced dynamics, new camera tools, and many others. Whether you're a visualization artist, motion designer, illustrator, or animator, you'll find something to love about Release 14. Our presenter, Paul Babb, is a graphics expert with nearly two decades of experience in the 3D animation, visual effects, and motion graphics industries. He is noted for successfully bringing Cinema 4D to the Americas through innovative marketing, customer service, and a progressive stance on product development. In addition to today's presentation, Paul Babb will also be here to answer your questions live during our Q&A session. Before we start the presentation, um, I would like to share with you some of what we've been working on here at Novedge. To purchase the latest version of Cinema 4D Studio R14, visit our product page at Novedge. As the leading online design software store, we pretty much have the best prices around. Cinema 4D Studio R14 is available as a digital download in North and South America without any sales tax tacked on. If you have any questions, feel free to speak with our sales specialist Bob at bobandnovedge.com. In Novedge, we created three communities as that online place where you can collaborate and communicate with other like-minded professionals. At our communities, we scour the internet for the latest industry buzz to share with you. Furthermore, we encourage community members to participate in the discussion. The process to sign up is a breeze, and with that you have access to a weekly community newsletter where we break down the week's most interesting industry headlines. For access to discussions that matter, sign up and register today. <laughs> Um, in our next Novage Best of the Best webinar, episode 64, Brian Hilner from the BunkSpeed team will be covering the essential tools available in BunkSpeed Pro Suite that will enable designers to excel and differentiate when selling and promoting their ideas. Don't miss this chance to hear from Brian and to get answers to your burning BunkSpeed questions. Registration is free, but space is limited. For more information on how to sign up, check it out at novedge.com slash forward webinar slash forward um, 64. Okay, so today's uh, presentation will be about 40 minutes long, and in just a bit, Paul will have the floor. If you have any questions at any time during the presentation, please post them in the chat window so we can answer them live during the Q&A session. Today's webinar uh, will be recorded. I'm recording right now. So if you want to rewatch this episode in its entirety, as always, you can find it on our Novage webinar series channel through Vimeo and YouTube. So with that said, let me see. Paul, are you ready? Okay. So, Paul, I'm going to make you the presenter right now. Okay. Ah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Can everybody hear me now? Yeah. There we go. The mic was uh, the mic was muted. Uh, well, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and and thanks for coming out to uh, to meet with us today. Um, uh, Cinema 4D release 14 actually came out in um, September. So there has been a lot of information out there. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll give everybody, a, I'll, I'll give you all an overview of, of everything that was in 14, and then I'll actually get in and demo a, a handful of the features that, um, that, I, I, that we felt might be suited to um, Novedge's audience. So uh, why don't we just get started? Anyway, so as I said, release 14 came out uh, September 1st. 
Um, very well received. It's got some great new features. Um, I'll give you a, a quick overview of those features. Um, the sculpting being one of the most interesting and, and uh, most anticipated features of, uh, of the 14 series. Um, and if you've been on any of our forums or any of our social networks, you've seen some We've seen some really nice models come out of there, some people playing with the, the sculpting tools. Um, the advantages, of course, is uh, there's a, a custom layout for sculpting. Um, it can handle millions of polygons, and uh, so you can really get sculpted out the kinds of details you would like to get into these types of characters. Um, you can freeze your sculpting at any time. Uh, this is a huge advantage, uh, having the sculpting tools be part of a full 3D package, because you can uh, maybe sculpt out a rough idea of what the model is going to be. You can texture, you can animate, you can do whatever you want with that model. Uh, and go back and continue your sculpting at another, at another time and all the other work that you've done is saved for you. Um, you can uh, apply deformations or free, uh, free up memory by freezing or applying those deformations to the, the mesh. Um, and there's a ton of brushes, there's stamps, there's stencils, there's uh, mirroring um, on all three axes. So you can be sculpting on all three axes. Um, and the sculpting system also allows for layers, just like uh, you would use in Photoshop. So you can actually sculpt uh, a, a layer. You can turn on and off layers while you're sculpting. You can create masks. You can change the, the strength of a mask, um, and you can change the order of which uh, layers are on top of each other. Uh, sorry, you can change the strength of a layer, etc. And of course, you can bake out your sculpt into um, a displace bitmap. Uh, including normals, ambient occlusion, um, et cetera, et cetera. And it actually will maintain your original sculpt object um, and provide you with uh, uh, a new model with uh, a folder for your textures. Um, I'm actually jumping ahead. Let me kind of go through some of the other features that are in 14. Um, there's some great camera enhancements. Uh, there's the camera calibrator, and I'm going to be focusing uh, this seminar in particular on those camera tools. Um, Nuke integration, which was a huge request from our uh, user base. Uh, Photoshop integration, we've actually created a plugin that so you can open uh, a Cinema 4D file directly in Photoshop, uh, manipulate it, paint it, do whatever you want to it. Um, Alembic support, we've been working very closely with Sony to um, provide that support to um, those who are using it. Uh, lots of little rendering improvements, some post features, uh, new aerodynamics, and uh, soft bodies that retain shape. Um, uh, some interface and workflow enhancements, uh, work planes, and things like that, and some nice little enhancements to Espresso that are both uh, cosmetic and uh, functional. Um, as I was saying, I kind of went dumb and dove into the sculpting a little bit more until I get to get this page. So, so basically, the integrated workflow is definitely a, a huge uh, ad, uh, advantage to having the sculpting tools inside of Cinema so that you can sculpt something. You can actually take a model that you have and sculpt on it. Uh, you can add detail to um, any model. And there are a series of, of nice presets in there so you can start off. There's some heads and other types of objects to get you started. Um, very powerful presets. Uh, the layer management system is great. And as I said, baking, uh, you, bake in, you can bake out everything, including the, the textures, displacement maps, ambient occlusion, um, into a separate object and still save off your raw sculpted object if you want to go back. New camera features. Uh, I'm going to go into these in detail after I kind of go through all the features, but um, there's some nice work added for, or nice tools added for, um, especially people doing visualization type of work um, for uh, morphing cameras, uh, motion cameras, and being able to uh, create the kind of uh, camera work that uh, you'd like to do for visualization. Uh, the camera calibrator, which I'll actually break down for you, allows you to take a 2D image and really quickly and easily calibrate the camera to that image so that you can uh, quickly create a 3D scene from that information or incorporate 3D objects into that scene. Uh, Nuke integration. Um, Nuke has become a very important and uh, valuable tool in the production 
pipeline, many production pipelines, uh, film and television especially. Uh, this has been one of the top requests uh, among our users in those uh, categories. And so we, uh, we've added uh, direct export out of Cinema 4D to Nuke. Um, it will automatically create a node structure to start with for the, uh, the compositor. Um, it supports multi-channel EXR, um, supports um, FBX, so you can bring those models over. Um, it brings over all your past layers just like you get, we're getting out of um, the After Effects exchange. And um, it, uh, it'll actually bring over a point pass as well, uh, so you can actually apply uh, different, um, different types of uh, uh, compositing passes to the point pass as well. Photoshop integration, uh, great for doing quick um, work inside of both, both adding detail with painting inside of Photoshop on a 3D object or incorporating a 3D object into your uh, 2D imagery. Um, it brings over the geometry, the textures, includes lights, includes cameras, so you can um, really manipulate um, your object and go back and forth between cinema and uh, Photoshop. Uh, there's some, some nice rendering improvements, um, some new shaders. There's a new uh, wood grain shader. Uh, there's a new weathering shader. You can see in that train the, the wood shader there and the, also in the, uh, the violin and the weathering there to the left and the, uh, the copper tubing. Um, there is a, uh, something, a new thing called for normalizer called normalizer for your normal maps. Um, there's a new subsurface scattering shader. Um, they added a, a shader for, um, to add knots to gradients or improve the gradients so you can add some knots. Uh, they combined the uh, specular and specular color kit channel. If you are a, already a Cinema 4D user, um, uh, you would, you'll notice that difference that you don't have to switch back and forth between the specular tab and the specular color tab. They've integrated that all into one tab now. And there's a, a new sampler for GI that supports radiosity maps. Um, some new post enhancements. Um, they made some changes to the picture viewer, a few tweaks. Um, you can actually see your stereoscopic images inside of the picture viewer, um, including layering and filtering. Um, you can um, do an automatic cache size so you can uh, play back animations um, that, that will actually fit your uh, RAM cache. Um, there is a base basic 32-bit uh, color correction tool. Um, and of course, uh, you can, there's a, a way to save your settings now inside of the picture viewer. So uh, if you want to make changes or have certain ways of certain filters or certain post processes you want to apply, you can actually save those settings. Um, let's see. And then you can see there's a, in the lower right there, that is a, a, a position-based mat. So you can um, you can basically, it's a representation of the objects in space in RGB. And that position pass is also um, utilized. A lot of that came about with the Nuke integration. Um, there were some, uh, some slight improvements to dynamics, including uh, the addition of aerodynamic forces. Uh, and those can be applied to pretty much anything. Um, plastic soft bodies so that uh, you can crush an object and it will retain the shape um, when you when you uh, mash two objects together. I have a, a, a neat little scene I'll show you for that one. And uh, has breakable connectors where there's a resistance where if I push hard enough on that plastic, it'll actually snap. So depending on what your settings are, it can snap uh, easily or with a little bit more force, but you can actually create a breakable plastic directly within Cinema 4D. Uh, okay, so let me get over to Cinema 4D. And I'm going to go ahead and start with a, a new scene and show you the, uh, the new um, camera calibrator. Switch my notes here. So the first thing I need to do, obviously, is create myself a camera. And, and in order to uh, start the process, I first need to uh, apply a, uh, a camera calibration tag right there under the tags, Cinema 4D tags. And I choose the camera calibrator tag. And I'm going to go ahead and activate that camera. So I'm looking through that actual camera. Now if I go to my calibration tab, 
the first thing I will, actually, I'm going to go to the image first because we've got to get ourselves an image. And I'm going to go ahead and pull uh, this back plate here. So this gives me a, a nice um, straight representation. The obviously linear objects are going to be easier to calibrate than more organic objects, but you can certainly there's certainly ways of working over that. But this this particular uh, image gives me a great uh, a demo starting place. So I've got my image in there, and I've got my camera activated. Now what I do is to calibrate. You go into the um, calibrate tab right here. Once you make sure you've got that calibrate um, tag selected and in the attributes manager I go over to the calibration tab and what I'm going to do is add lines and grids to define the space inside of the image so I'm going to go ahead and click on uh, create a grid here and I'll start by uh, positioning that grid on the uh, oops jumped on me after I let go and you can see it zooms in for me so that I can actually uh, better place the points. It gives me a nice close-up look of where I'm trying to apply or trying to position the grid's points. And let's see, I'll move this one over here down at the bottom. My mouse is being a little bit uncooperative. There we go. And last but not least, I go over here and I'll apply that corner down here. And of course, the more accurate you are in your placement, the more accurate your calibration is going to be. Now, once I've positioned that, um, that grid, uh, you can see when I put my mouse over it, it kind of highlights the grid. If I hold the Shift key and click up here on the top of that grid, you'll notice over here on the right, it's asking, am I calibrating that for which axes? Right now, it starts with X, Y. You can see it changed to Y or Z. And right here to Z. And you can see as I'm doing it, it's, it's trying to solve. This, of course, is my Z. So I will leave that at um, let's see, one, two, three, Z. There we go. And then, and then I'm going to go on to the edge, and I'm going to uh, set that to the Y. So here you can see that that uh, grid is a Z, Y, OK. And of course, it gives you a little um, representation of, of how much of the image so far has been solved uh, for, the, for the camera's position. Still needs a little work, obviously. So let's, uh, let's grab a line. And uh, so I'll pop the line um, right here. And why don't we take this one here. And this will give us a nice long representation for the X axis. And I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And it gives me X. And now it's getting a little closer. Let's see. We need another. Let's add another line. And let's work on uh, a little bit more on the Z. And again, the more accurate you are, I'm not going to kill myself. Go see X, there's Z. Now, we're see, we're getting a little closer now. We've got Z vanishing point. It's solved to a 0 0.034 detail. So we're, we're getting a little closer. Uh, let's go ahead and add another line. There we go. And I think this time I'll try to maybe get something on this side. Still working out the X. Oops. And once again, let's solve that. X. OK. Looks like we need a little bit more solution in the, the Y here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's just get another grid out of here. And um, maybe we'll. Maybe we'll go back on this side here. Maybe, maybe a grid would work, give us a little bit more detail. My goodness, my mouse is not very, there we go. Must not be working on a good surface, there we go. And 
I'm going to... Now, there's a good representation of why I actually probably need to use this edge here because that Z edge is not giving me the final corner. And so I would be guessing where that is. Come on. Here we go. I'm actually going to go, whoops. I'm actually going to go to the front edge here. Here we go. There we go. Ugh. My mouse is being uncooperative. Here we go. Wow. My apologies. Very uncooperative mouse today. There we go. There we go. Okay. And let's go ahead and shift on that and get our Y. Shift on that. Get our X. Here we go. Now we're getting much closer to our solution here. The other thing you can do too is go ahead and select this grid and right here I have a, uh, a doorway and let's say I knew the exact measurements of that doorway. Uh, you know, as an architect I might go in here and say okay I know that that's uh, 8 feet. So I can actually go into the known length Y and uh, even though I'm working in centimeters I can actually just go ahead and type in 8 feet and Cinema will automatically uh, calculate that for me. And now that gives me, gives me a little bit better solution here. I'm pretty close to being solved. The X is being a little, uh, still a little difficult. We can always do a little more on the X plane here by sort of estimating this long sidewalk area. And maybe get a little edge there. See if that helps my calculation. There we go. So I'm getting a few more greens. I still got a couple of uh, I still got the yellow and the Y, um, and I'm not really getting much on the camera focal length. But I'm I'm pretty darn close to uh, getting a solution for that. So the one thing I need to do is now is now that I've got the general idea, I'm going to go ahead and add a pin to the world axis. Now you see I've got it's giving me my camera focal length and the camera orientation position based on, it's, it's basically assuming uh, information based on the grids and lines that I've positioned in the scene. So it, it basically sets that scale for the scene sort of the way it, it thinks it's working. Um, I'm going to go ahead and create a background object um, and a, a camera mapping tag. And what I can do with this is now I can I can actually add geometry to this scene if I just need to add something to the scene. Um, you can see I can it's automatically coming in calibrated to the scene. So the the axes are calibrated in the position where the camera is uh, placed. So it's it's actually working within the parameters of the scene. And if I'd like to, what I can do is I could go ahead and use this um, uh, this camera mapping projection to actually place geometry in the right locations and I could project onto the geometry to uh, create uh, a, a more 3D representation of this model just by basically applying the camera mapping projection to this and map out that whole that whole scene. Now I can switch over so I can show you some of the camera to other camera tools that were added. I'm going to switch over to a scene that's actually uh, finished. So here's that same scene and now geometry has been placed in, in that uh, position. And you can see as I move the camera around I've given myself a rudimentary 3D scene just based on some simple primitive geometry and calibrating uh, that particular image. So you can see it's a very powerful tool for um, establishing an environment with just a simple image um, in your scene. Uh, let me move over to, I'm going to show you, uh, let me show you the um, camera morphing tools. So uh, let's say I have an idea, I would like to uh, start uh, my, uh, an animation, uh, sort of an overview of this architectural piece from this position. And then I'm going to create a second camera and activate it. Oops. 
and I'm going to activate that camera and I'm going to move over and let's say uh, during that uh, animation or presentation I'd like to uh, get to uh, maybe this position here in the scene and I'll create a third camera activate that one and uh, let's say at the end I would like to um, perhaps get a little closer up to this uh, doorway and end up in the animation here. So you can choose your focal points or the focus points of your presentation with different cameras and then and then morph from those cameras to get exactly what you want out of your presentation. So I'm going to select those three cameras in the object manager over here and then I'm going to go over to my create camera and I'm going to create a camera morph. Now, because I had those three cameras selected, you can see in my morph camera tag, it's automatically uh, dropped those three cameras into the um, source cameras field. And uh, right here is the blend, where it's actually blending between the different cameras. So what first we have to do is activate the morph camera. And now you can see as I move through the the blend, it is blending between those two different cameras. Let me go slow down. Oh, it's actually playing back pretty well, isn't it? Okay. So, okay, so let's just show a little, illustrate a little bit more on that. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create some keyframes. I'm going to keyframe the blend between those cameras uh, at frame zero. Um, and if you don't know Cinema 4D, anything you see that has a little uh, dot here next to it is actually animatable. And all I have to do to animate that particular parameter is to uh, control and click on the parameter to create a keyframe there. Um, comes in handy. You can actually uh, animate the, the stabilizer, the source mode, and pretty much any other uh, parameter of different objects. It's very helpful. Okay, then I'm going to go to the end of the timeline. I'm going to uh, uh, go to 100% blend, and uh, you can see it's yellow, meaning that uh, it's uh, different from what you've keyed at the in your different frame. And I'm going to go ahead and just control click to key that frame there. And now what I've got is a, a nice animation through uh, based on the three cameras that I've positioned. Now, um, originally I had put those cameras in a different order. Nice thing is down here I can actually. Um, I can actually reorder those cameras while it's animating. I'm going to go ahead and put the make it back to camera one and two and three, and uh, or I can change it to one, three, and two. Um, but you can see I can interactively sort of get a feel for what I'd like um, in that. Um, I can even uh, go into uh, the blend track if I want to. I can go ahead and look at the F curve for that track. And if I'd like to, I can actually change um, the way the, the uh, morph changes from camera to camera based on any kind of curve I'd like to draw in there to get the exact type of presentation effect that you're looking for. And uh, let me go back to the morph camera tab again. And if you'll notice in my morph tracks, uh, distracting over here, you can actually morph between uh, the different aspects of each camera as well. As you can see, you can morph between the focal length, the sensor size, the uh, distance, depth of field, balance, stereo parameters, f-stop, ISO. Um, you can morph between many aspects of the camera for different types of effects. And again, as you can see, these are all um, animatable, which is, uh, gives you a lot of flexibility in what you can do. Okay, so that's great, but let's say I wanted to get more of a, um, a handheld camera feel. So another way of going about that same presentation would be, uh, let's say I'm going to do, a, I want to do a, um, a, a sort of a handheld camera. So what I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and draw the path that I would like a, a camera to go and roughly try to rough out what I did with the, uh, with the morph cameras. So I'm right here looking on my um, top down view and I'm going to go ahead and just grab the spline tool and I'm going to, I'm going to draw. I went over this way and then I curved around back over here. There we go. Getting some weird display things here. 
Um, and then uh, I'm going to uh, change back to my object mode. And uh, I'm going to move that up a little bit. So we got just about waist high. And I'm going to uh, set up a camera, create a camera. I've got my camera too. And I'm going to select the camera and the spline that I've drawn. And I'm going to go over to create. And I'm going to create a, a motion camera. And once again, you can see that uh, in the animation tab of that motion uh, camera tag, um, that it has already applied the path spline here. Um, as you can see, you can also add a rail spline and another path spline, so you can have complex paths that you pa that you can uh, utilize to move a camera. And uh, down here, as far as targets are concerned, uh, it's got a camera which is not correct, actually. See, I've actually selected the wrong thing. What I'd like to do is I want the target to be the window, not the, uh, the uh, camera, obviously. I'd like the camera to be targeting the window. I uh, kind of messed that one up. So uh, you're going to have the camera follow this path, and you're going to have the camera target uh, this position, so that, that particular window. And that's right. Uh, that window is right here. We just placed it just as a position. OK, back to that tab. So now, once again, uh, the camera position uh, here is based on the position on the spline. And you can see my little character moving there. Um, I'm going to go, let me pull back on a different camera so you can see that uh, the it actually gives you a little representation of a little stick figure moving through space with a uh, handheld camera. There he is moving in. And as you can see, the camera is maintaining its focal point on that, or its focus on that camera, and the little character is following the spline that we drew. Um, the spline uh, we'll take take them where it needs to go. Okay, so now once again, I will. Uh, I'm going to animate that camera. I'm going to go ahead and just click, uh, control click, at the first position, and then go to the end of the animation and go to 100%, and click a control. Now, what that is doing is it's animating along that spline from zero to 100%. So from one end of the spline to the other. You can obviously change that to any. Uh, part of the spline you want. You can reshape the spline, etc. And let me activate that camera. Now you can see from the point of view of that camera. Now the one thing you'll notice is that the spline seems a little bit high. It seems the cameraman's a little tall. Let me just pause that and um, get to a place where there you go. It's a little closer there. So I'm going to go back to my uh, my front view here, or right view. And I'm going to select my spline, and I'm going to bring that down a little bit. And you can see in the perspective view, and kind of eye from the position of a regular size. Now, the the actual stick figure being used does use a um, average height. I think it's six foot or five ten or something or five eleven, something along those lines. But you can change that as well if you want to. Um, okay, so now I have animated. Uh, the the uh, camera along the spline. And uh, so let's take a look at some of the other things you can do. Um, you've got dynamics. Uh, if we just go ahead and play that, you can actually enable foot dynamics so that um, as the he's walking along, you can actually enable uh, some steps. You can see as he's walking, you're actually, this is actually pretty fast, isn't it? Extend that for you. There we go. I'm going to extend the animation a little bit here so it slows him down. Okay. So now you can see the, the footsteps a little bit. go. And you can enable some head dynamics. So like he's, he's, he's turning his head a little bit. Uh, let 
let's actually let me grab a hold of the actual keyframe. There we go. There we go. So you can see now we're getting a little bit of foot movement, a little bit of head movement. Um, you can change with that play, play with the dampening of the position and the rotation so you get a little less movement. Um, you can change the type of mode, whether it's a spring or a dampening. Uh, there's also hand dynamics and focus dynamics as well so that you can control not only the so pretty much every aspect you can get a kind of a, a nice handheld feel based on uh, a lot of different uh, a lot of different of the dynamic functions here. Uh, you can actually add intensity to the footsteps. Um, and again, these are all animatable parameters. Everywhere you see a dot, I can animate these parameters so it can start out with a little bit more intensity on the the uh, the footsteps, the um, head rotation, etc and really get a feel like uh, you got a guy carrying a camera for you. You can see that. Is that, I uh, hope that's playing back. Ah, it's okay. I've got, uh, got another laptop next to me I can actually see playback. It's, you're not seeing some of the subtlety of the footsteps. You can see here if I move this slightly, there's right there where he stops for a second there, you can see there's some subtlety of footstep. It's kind of interesting. Okay. Okay, so um, that's pretty much the that's the morph camera and the motion camera. That's uh, some of the nice little camera tools you can go on in there. Um, how are we doing on time? Got another five minutes. Let me show you the uh, soft bodies real quick. Um, this is uh, um, a nice little representation of the uh, the soft body dynamics, including the the breaking of them. You can actually see this is an, an active working candy machine where a uh, a ball, uh, a candy ball or a, a, a gumball is dropping into a, a wrapper and the machine is actually crimping each end of the wrapper to hold the gumball in place and as it uh, crimps at the top it's actually breaking off the plastic uh, tubing or the plastic wrap at the top so that it releases the candy, uh, candy uh, the gumball, excuse me, on the top. So I've, I've actually added a little um, HUD control here so I can actually turn off most of the geometry and uh, let me um, let me move in whoops let me uh, zoom in so you can actually see the uh, plastics at work okay so I'm gonna go ahead and play this and you can't see the crimpers but as you can see they're crimping the plastic the plastic is wrapped around a sheath and as you can see as the crimp pushes up against it, it is uh, the plastic wrap is retaining the shape that you're crimping it into and at some point uh, it is meeting its resistance and snapping that uh, the uh, plastic wrap at the top and then the dynamics uh, allow it to fall down through the machine. There you go. If I turn that back on you can see there's the crimpers on the inside, there's the crimp at the top and then as it releases it the um, gravity pulls it. So actual working uh, candy making machine inside of, uh, inside of Cinema 4D. Uh, I'm going to close this one really quick. And we also on the um, whoops, the aerodynamics, I actually have a, a working sort of tricyclopter um, with controls. Uh, press play and uh, this this uh, little tricycle helicopter will actually fly on its own uh, based on real dynamics within Cinema 4D. And you can see a little heads-up camera from the point of view of the camera inside the cockpit. And uh, somebody created some nice controls. You can control the, the uh, angle, speed, and, and direction of the tricycloptor. So you can actually have a little fun playing with that, animate it, and uh, animate it to your own devices. And let's see. We can. Uh, let's see. I think I think that was about 
it in terms of some of the features. Let me, um, real quick, let me show you I, uh, if uh, there are a ton of features in Release 14, and it's really hard to show all of them in 40 minutes. <laughs> so uh, I kind of highlighted some of the ones that uh, we thought that would be um, uh, interesting to the Novetch crowd, and maybe some that hadn't been highlighted that much uh, earlier in other, other presentations. Um, if you go to Cineversity.com, which is our uh, video tutorial site, um, you can see on the front page, uh, right here, Cineversity.com, uh, right here on the first page is New and Release 14. Uh, and if you click on that, uh, we put together some really nice videos that kind of uh, outline, overview all the great features that have been added to Release 14. As you can see, it's a 12-part uh, 12, 12 series, and you've got some workflow and interface enhancements, the sculpting tools, the camera enhancements, uh, the snapping and work plane enhancements for your workflow, uh, the camera calibrator, dynamics, uh, the espresso enhancements, um, the rendering uh, enhancements, some of the post effects, uh, the picture viewer post effects and nuke integration that were added, and the, the new uh, Photoshop integration, which is a nifty little plug-in that we provided uh, that you just add in and, uh, Cine and Cinema files can be opened natively in, uh, into uh, after, uh, excuse me, Adobe uh, Photoshop. So you can open up our models directly in the Photoshop. So that's that's a handy little tool as well. So if you'd like to get more detail and see a lot more uh, detail about the features that are inside of 14, go to Cineversity, uh, watch any of these uh, particular tutorials that uh, you'd be interested in. Uh, I think I've gone about 45, and I was given 40. Uh, were there any? Let me go to the. Were there any questions? Hi, um, Paul. Thank you so much. Um, so I have a couple of questions here. Um, can you all, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Ah, sure can. So, okay, so the first question is sculpting. As I, uh, this um, Thomas here wrote sculpting. As I know, there are some problems with backing textures concerning displacement maps in tangent mode. So the map isn't usable for animation, only for stills. Are you aware of that? Uh, repeat that again? Okay, so um, it says sculpting. As I know, there are some problems with backing textures concerning displacement maps in tangent mode. So the map is not usable for animation, only for stills. Are you aware of that? I have not heard that. I believe that's going to be depending on implementation if you're talking about if you're talking about baking it out to a displacement map yeah there may be some limitations on that um, my recommendation is to contact your local tech support uh, office and they can probably tell you how to uh, optimize that or utilize it in a way that would give you the results you're looking for Okay, so then um, I have uh, Elton that wants to know how to align multiple objects. How to align multiple objects? Multiple objects. Multiple objects. Uh, how do you align? In, in what sense? Are we, talking about, are we talking about a particular feature I've shown or... I am not sure, and I see that Elton here left the webinar. <laughs> so oh, this, is all, this is all he wrote. I um, don't know if that was in relation to the camera calibrator or if that was just basic functionality of Cinema 4D. Yeah, unfortunately, that's all he wrote. And, 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 and aligning them in what shape or form? Are we aligning them along a spline or aligning them in space? Or, yeah, I guess it's kind of a, it, it kind of needs a, a little bit of clarification because there's different ways of doing that. Um, Somebody, I, I, I did see um, Nicholas had asked about, um, he wished he had seen more detail about the last two, um, uh, the setups with the camera. And um, once again, if anybody, if you missed any of this or you missed something, you can go back and watch the videos on Cineversity. A lot of what I've done is maybe using different files or is, is in there, but the, the basic uh, steps and functionality is in there. I have another question for Helmut here that says camera calibration. The pin tool represents the X, Y, Z, 0, 0, 0, right? 
That is correct, Helmut. Um, that uh, it's going to be utilizing the information that you're providing, the the grids and and uh, lines, when you're defining the. Basically, you're using those lines and grids to define the space inside of Cinema 4D based on the image that you've created. And Cinema is going to make some assist, uh, some assumptions about um, what environment you've created. So it's going to place your world axis, your 000, uh, based on the information you've provided through the cal camera calibrator. Yes. Okay, and then I have another question here that says, if you use the camera projection for the building in the camera calibrator, why wasn't it distorted when viewed through other cameras? Why wasn't it distorted? Exactly. Well, that's the that's the that's the magic behind it. It's it's it's, um, it's a way of creating a. It's not going to get distorted because you're actually creating a representation of that uh, of that image in three D space. Um, you. If I had been less, and actually in that scene, it's a little distorted because I wasn't as precise with my placement of the points as I could be. Um, if you noticed in the that the cube is actually deforming a little bit, or not deforming, but it's it's um, stretching a little bit based on the the space. Um, here, let me get rid of the one I've resized. You actually you you want the result to be that uh, you end up with. Um, uh, a non-distorted space. That's the idea behind it. Now you can see I'm getting a, a cube. Uh, the cube is very uh, uniform here. As it's going back, see it's it's going rectangular a little bit, and that's because I probably wasn't as um, um, precise with my placement as I could be. You can be, you know, obviously it is the more precise you are, the the better the results. But you can see it's it's distorting a little bit based on that. But that's because I didn't do a very good job of my of the work I was doing. You the the idea behind this is that you are creating a realistic representation of what's in the image and uh, so it won't be distorted. So I, I received a few more questions um, right now as you're answering this. One is from um, Philip, I'm guessing, um, how you say that? It's V-Ray or Maxon Render? He's asking if it's what's better? <laughs> I'm guessing that's, uh, that's a question right there, V-Ray or Maxon Render. Yep, he um, says yes. He says he's asking which one. Um, oh, which one is better? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you the politically correct answer. I think that I think that each renderer has uh, you know great features of it. There's Cinema's built-in renderer is 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 really nice and very serviceable. It does some great work. I mean, it's got great GI, great 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 things in it. There are some things that V-Ray can do that we can't. Um, V-Ray is very specialized in in what they in what they do. And I would say it would depend on the, the project that you're doing. Um, I think there are going to be some cases where V-Ray is going to give you uh, a result that you're, uh, you know, maybe the result you're looking for. Um, but there is going to be many, many times that the, the cinema for the built-in renderer is going to give you what you need. It all depends on, on what you're trying to accomplish. But, I think uh, um, they're, they're both very good renderers. Great. Um, so then I have uh, two more questions. Photoshop integration. Can you paint with Photoshop like with body paint? Yes. Yeah, you can actually paint on the you can actually paint on the 3D object inside of uh, Photoshop. You're actually the the model is actually inside of Photoshop. You know, and actually I would I I could show you that right now, but for some reason Photoshop is not recognizing my graphics card, and so it's not allowing me to open a 3D object. I was was struggling with that uh, just before we came on, um, but you can literally open a 3D model inside of a Photoshop. You can rotate it, uh, move it. Um, even the hierarchy is is saved, so you can move the individual pieces around, and you can paint directly on the object or the parts of the object. Uh, and because Cinema supports uh, PSDs or Photoshop files as well, including layers, um, you can even uh, create new layers, uh, paint on those layers, make adjustments to those layers, go back to cinema, and if you've saved all that, uh, you can actually, you know, your layers will pre be preserved inside of cinema as well. Great. So um, here, are a few more questions keep coming in, so I'm going to keep going. Um, are, okay. there, are there enhancements to the character object? Uh, not in 14. Um, that is something they're definitely you know, there, we're well. We're always trying to improve everything inside the application, but there were not any. Um, I, there may have been some 
minor tweaks, but nothing of note. Okay, and then uh, Bob asks, is there a GOZ plugin? I'm hoping I say this right. <laughs> A uh, GoZ plugin Go for ZBrush. Yes, 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 there is. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Great. Um, and then the last question from Ian: Inside the motion camera focus options, there is a much needed option for the depth control to add a depth of field effect for post. Any plans to add this option to other cameras? Huh. That's a good question. Um, there. Uh, you know, the politically correct answer is always that they're always looking for ways to improve the program and, and everybody's feedback is taken into account. Um, I do believe, but I'll be less politically correct and um, say that I, I do believe that um, we had a discussion with a, another studio about that specifically. Um, whether, it's in, whether it's in development right now, I can't comment on it. I, I'm not sure. I, I don't even really know. But I do, I do know that that came up in conversation uh, a couple of times. Uh, from a couple of other studios, I should say. So it is, it is a feature that has been requested. Okay, so thank you so much, Deco. Oh, one last, very last question. Okay, we'll take it. Can you make spline, a spline dynamic on MoGraph Tracer Spliner? Can you make a... Spline on dynamic. Mo, on most, um, using most spline? Uh, MoGraph. MoGraph tracer. Well, there's in, inside. Of, yeah, inside of MoGraph, there's something called MoSpline. I don't know. I don't know. I think I don't know if you can actually use MoSplines with a tracer object. I don't. I've never tried that personally. Not that I'm a production guy. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to have to. Well, you know what? If you can get his information, I will definitely follow up with that one. I I don't know if you can use a MoSpline object with the MoGraph tracer object. Okay. That would be interesting. I will see if I can get um, Nico in touch with you and, and see if we can get the answer then later. Okay, so um, I'm going to switch back to my screen. Uh, Paul, thank you so much. We're going to wrap thank it you. up right now. Uh, let's see. And thank you, everybody, for being uh, patient with me here. Let's see. Show my screen. Okay, all right, here it is. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And uh, thank you so much, Paul. And from our team at Noveg, thank you for co-hosting this webinar with us. So for, for more information about Cinema 4D Release 14, you can visit um, Maxon's webpage at maxon.net. Right here, so the download version of Cinema 4D Studio Release 14 is the very best that Maxon has to offer for professional 3D artists. If you want the power to create jaw-dropping 3D graphics quickly and easily, then this is the choice for you. As well as containing all of the features found in Cinema 4D Prime, visualize and broadcast, Cinema 4D Studio adds advanced character tools, hair, a physics engine, and unlimited clients network rendering. Cinema 4D Studio R14 can tackle any project you throw at it with ease. As the leading online design software store, we pretty much have the best prices around. Cinema 4D Studio R14 is available at Novage as a digital download in North and South America with no sales tax. If you have any questions, feel free to speak with our sales specialist, Bob, at bob.noveg.com. Additionally, join in on the conversation at Wikicad, Vector Working, or Rhino Jungle. Why not all three? Don't miss this opportunity to interact with other like-minded professionals. Signing up is a breeze, and with that, you have access to a weekly community newsletter. For access to discussions that matter, register today. Okay, so if you have any questions, comments, or concerns um, for Noveg or about today's webinar, please don't hesitate to contact Kevin at kevinandnoveg.com. Kevin is our um, webinar um, host. He's usually the one that does this. Now me, I'm substituting today. And in our, up, uh, in our upcoming Noveg webinar, episode 64, we will have Brian Hilner from the Buckspeed team here to cover the essential tools available in Bugspeed Pro Suite. 
the tools that will enable designers to excel and send out when presenting their ideas. Don't miss this chance to hear from Brian and to get answers to your burning bunk speed questions. Registration is free, but space is limited. So for more information on how to sign up, check it out at novedge.com webinar series. Okay, so if you want to rewatch episode 63, it will be online on our YouTube and Vimeo channels um, by tomorrow morning. And also on the same channels, you can find all of the past webinars. Please share with your friends and check them out. Okay, so lastly, follow us on Twitter and the Veg Store, where we will share with you the latest buds, worthy industry news, trends, and promos. Join the conversation and follow us today. Okay, so Paul, anything else you would like to share? Uh, me? Yes. Anything else? You're, oh you're no! Thank you so okay. much for having me on. I, I I really I really appreciate the opportunity to come out and uh, and uh, talk to everybody. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And uh, again, if you get any follow up questions, please uh, feel free to forward them to me, and I'll I'll check with my tech guys and get the answers for them. Thank you. Thank you again on behalf of our team and the badge, and thank you all of you who join us for the webinar. I'm gonna stop recording and I'll stop the webinar right now. Thank you and.